Hey all, welcome back to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. My name is Darren, I'm your host, and today we have a very special guest, Mr. Stephen Reichlin of the Barbecue Bible, Barbecue University, Project Smoke, and many, many other barbecue books and TV shows. Can't wait to get on there. I'll talk to you in just a minute with Stephen Reichlin. Smoking, grilling, getting hot and hotter, sous vide and chilling from fire and water. Hey all, before we get on to the show, I want to talk to you for a second about Instacart. Instacart's a great service that allows you to do all your grocery shopping online. And they can get you your groceries in as fast as one hour. They connect you with personal shoppers in your area that know your markets. And they can get them from your favorite stores. They find all the great buys and smart suggestions for you online to save you money. They pick the freshest produce. And they check your eggs and make sure they're not cracked. Check them out, guys. Instacart is offering free delivery on your first order of over $35 on the link below. Check them out. And now, on to the show. Welcome back to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. I'm Darren. I'm your host. And today, I've got a really special guest, Mr. Stephen Reichlin, the barbecue uh, guru himself. Uh, Stephen, welcome to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. Um, You don't really need an introduction, but why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself real quick? Well, I'm Stephen Reichlin, the author of the Barbecue Bible Cookbook Series, the host of Project Fire and Project Smoke on PBS founder of barbecue university and uh i guess that's uh those are my main credits <laughs> and author of 31 over 31 books a five-time james beard award winner uh <laughs> just the list goes on and on i'm really grateful for you being on here today uh and I just want to, you know, so for some of those that don't know who you are, which it's kind of hard to believe there is, but you, you kind of started, I want to, I want to talk about how you got started in the, in the uh, barbecue, uh, making that your career. So I've read some of your history and you've got some pretty impressive credentials. I'd like to know what you studied with when you started med- medieval cooking. Well, I got a degree in French literature and took a wrong turn. So I guess that's how I wound up in barbecue, but Uh, After I graduated from Reed College, I won what was called a Thomas J. Watson Foundation Fellowship. Tom Watson founded IBM, and these fellowships were for a year's independent study abroad after college. Only two strings attached, couldn't be academic, and you couldn't do it in the United States. So in college, I was a medievalist and a French lit major, and I wrote my thesis on an obscure medieval French poet who turned out to be Europe's first feminist, but that's another story. Anyhow, uh, while in the stacks researching, uh, doing research for my thesis, I came across a medieval cookbook and just something clicked. I was like amazed to think that here was a cookbook from 700 years ago, uh, back when cookbooks had to be written out by hand. And I, the, the recipes were exotic. The ingredients were unfamiliar. The names of the dishes were unfamiliar. And yet uh, it was obvious that people were very serious and systematic, as, as serious and systematic about cooking then as we are now. So uh, I applied for this fellowship. There may have been a bottle or two of Retsina wine involved the night I wrote my proposal. But much to my amazement, I was awarded a Watson and basically given 7000 bucks to eat and drink my way through Europe, which back in uh, 1975 was a lot of money. And that got me to Europe thinking about the intersection of food and history and culture. And to some extent, I've been doing that ever since. Yeah, that that amazes me. I just been reading your history that that um, some of the things that you have uh, studied and, and, and how, how you uh, started all these uh you know, books. You started as an author. Um, so how, how did you go about doing that? How, how did you start thinking, I want to, I want to write some of the, write some books about all these different cooking, uh, cooking styles. Well, that's very interesting. My first job, uh, my first paying job, uh, was as a translator, translating the memoirs of, uh, the owner of La Tour de Chant restaurant in Paris. And the, uh, first paying job in the States was that of restaurant critic for Boston magazine. 
And from there, I became the wine and spirits editor for GQ magazine. Uh, and I had a mentor named Anne Willen, who was the founder of the Lava and Cooking School, where I trained in Paris. That's kind of where I got my formal culinary training. And Anne said to me, uh, you know, Steve, you'll never make a living writing cookbooks. So the gauntlet was hurled down and uh, I decided I was going to make a living writing cookbooks. Now, it took me many cookbooks to actually do that. But uh, I found, I, I, you know, when you write a magazine article, you're paid one time and the it's called Work for Hire. And, um, you know, the magazine makes all the profit. But when you write a book, although it's a risky business and the odds are stacked against you, if you do write a successful book, you know, it goes on earning money and earning money. So it became pretty obvious to me pretty early on that writing books was a better business magazine than writing articles. Did you ever work in a restaurant um, you know, under a chef, for a chef, as a chef? Uh, I did. Uh, I My first restaurant job was at a Michelin-starred restaurant in Brittany. Uh, you know, hello, French, French, uh, French literature major. And uh, it was a very amazing experience, but it taught me that uh, where I wanted to be was involved in the editorial side of things, not in the actual banging pots or pans around side of things. Yeah, I, I can understand that. I, I, when I was young, I started working in restaurants and I, I learned really quick. I love to eat. I love to cook, but I didn't like working in a restaurant. Right. <laughs> it, it, it's a high pressure, a lot of work, hard work, a lot of hours. And, you know, unless you're really, you know, famous as a chef, you know, the pay is not the greatest either. So, and, uh, but I can understand why you'd want to get on the uh, other side. And, well, it was, and, you know, it was just intellectually, it was more interesting. You know, um, yeah. every day is different, you know, and you learn. I mean, one of my great principles in life is to try and learn something new every day or learn many things new every day. And it's much easier to do that with writing than it is, you know, uh, being a line chef. Right. So what, what led you down the road of kind of focusing or, or, um, paying more attention to outdoor cooking and barbecue and smoking. Well, that was funny. That was one of those crazy epiphanies that happens in life. Uh, I remember I'd, I'd been a food writer for 15 years. I had written about French cuisine. I'd written about Floridian cuisine. And uh, to set the stage, it was November 1994, one of those beautiful, clear, sunny days after that muggy, hot Florida weather is over. I remember where I was sitting, what I was wearing. And it was as though time slowed down and I heard this voice and the voice said, follow the fire. And the idea was uh, I should travel around the world and document how people grill in different countries and cultures because grilling is universal. It's the world's oldest cooking method. It's practiced almost everywhere on the planet, but it's done differently almost everywhere on the planet. And so uh, I dashed off a book proposal to my publisher, Workman Publishing. Usually it takes a month to write a book pro proposal. I had it done in a morning. And then uh, I had a contract back by the end of the week. And that was equally remarkable because it usually takes a month to get a contract back. But I think my publisher, the visionary Peter Workman, uh, saw the potential of the idea, maybe even more than I did. Uh, so there I was in barbecue. And... I thought Barbecue Bible would be a quick, simple book, 100 recipes, so, you know, I would uh, write it in a year. And it wound up becoming a four-year project. Uh, I actually wrote three other books during that time in order to continue writing Barbecue Bible because it was a very expensive book to write. But happily, it, um, you know, it paid off. It, uh, the book came out and it was, a, it was an instant bestseller. And so... There I was in barbecue. Now, it's funny because after that happened, I thought, well, gee, this traveling around the world to write about a topic is pretty cool. Maybe I should write a noodle Bible next to follow the barbecue Bible. And I worked on it and it just kind of wasn't feeling right, but uh, I did do a proposal on it. And then one night that may or may not have been substance enhanced, I made a list of all <laughs> the things I would like to do with barbecue. And that list included 
uh, a TV show. It included a barbecue university. It included a line of products. It included a website. It included an international program. It included uh, eight or nine other books on the topic of barbecue. And I'm a great believer in list making. And I made that list. And uh, darn if I haven't been checking the items off the list, you know, for the last 20 years. Well, it seems to me that it's something you found something you were really passionate about, which I think anybody who's successful at anything has to be passionate about it. And you're right. I mean, fire, you know, cooking with fire, whether it's grilling or smoking is the oldest cooking method, because that's how we all started cooking. You know, that's how, you know, humans started cooking food was, you know, you know, uh, lightning struck a tree and fire started and something fell on it and we discovered how to cook food. (laughs) So, um, and everywhere you go, like you said, is, is they, they use fire differently, but, um, well, I think, you know, I think what has attracted me to the field and kept me interested is that it's simultaneously very broad and very deep. By broad, I mean that, you know, the world is your uh, subject matter. Uh, By deep, I mean that you can go, you can drill down so deep in the various topics. You know, you can can go into the gear, you can go into the history, you can go into barbecue sauces, you can go into American barbecue, you can go into world barbecue. Uh, you can focus on different meats like uh, ribs or my most recent book, uh, The Brisket Chronicles. It's a, it's a very broad subject. I think the other piece about it is that people feel so passionately about it. You know, you cook a pot of soup, you bake a loaf of bread, nobody gathers around your stove. You light a grill and it's an instant party and you're the center of attention. And um, and I have found that, you know, I've had just amazing experiences over the course of my career. I mean, taking my family to Japan where I battled the Iron Chef, uh, uh, riding a camel to a barbecue in Morocco, um, uh, taking boats, taking tuk-tuks, taking trains, uh, uh, you you name it. I I mean, eating grilled guinea pig in Peru, uh, eating... uh, a freshly slaughtered suckling pig in Bali, Indonesia. Uh, it's it's been an amazing, amazing run. Yeah, it sounds like, and that's one thing I want to talk about. When you were writing these cookbooks and you kind of locked on to um, the barbecue Bible, uh, when did it start? When you started getting into the TV shows and all that, and how how was your transition from being a book writer, an author, to getting in front of a camera? Well, in, a short, in, in, in very brief, uh, the transition was a difficult and awful. Uh, <laughs> I am not a natural on television, but I decided I wanted to do it. And uh, bless his heart, Peter Workman, the founder of Workman Publishing. I told him I wanted to do his TV show, and he said, you know what, I'll be your first sponsor. And um, his uh, lieutenant kicked him under the table, but it was too late. So... Uh, so I decided to do this TV show. The first series was called Barbecue University, named after my school. And um, it was uh, not the love at first, uh, at, at first soundbite. Uh, I, I remember they counted down three, two, one, and action. And I opened my mouth and no words came out. <laughs> and it took me a long time to learn how to do television. But any rate, I persisted because uh, I had, I felt I had something to say and people responded to it well. And um, it's, that has gotten easier over the years. And it also has a, you know, it's true. Explaining something in words is, is one thing, but kind of showing it on television is another thing. That's pretty amazing. And then uh, I, I did the first four seasons of, um, of uh, Barbecue University, and they were uh, with a producer who, let's just say that we were not, we were not simpatico. And I thought that, uh, I thought that TV was just had to be a hideous experience because it was, you know, it was a very tense set and everybody was yelling and that I just thought that's what TV was. And then when I switched to Primal Grill, I switched producers and I found a wonderful producer who, uh, you know, made it a collaborative effort and it became a lot more fun and a lot more, uh, a lot easier. 
And so, you know, I say as I'm getting ready to uh, produce uh, season three of uh, Project Fire that I'm actually looking forward to it. Yeah, I think uh, I think there's two different or there's different kinds of learners out there. And I, I discovered that when I I started a little YouTube channel. I'm nowhere near as <laughs> like you, but, I, you know, I've discovered that there's visual learners who need to see a video and then there's people that can read and, and, and take it off of the, the words off a page and, and, and learn from that. But I, I've also found that there's people that need, you know, to, to see it in a video form. So I think it's great that you have both out there that, um, that you're able to teach people something that you love and that they love and that they, they can do it, you know, whether, whatever, whatever kind of learner they are, whether it be a visual or, or somebody that can read it from a book. Yeah. It's, um, it's been quite, quite an adventure. You know, it's funny. I always say of television that it's the two hardest weeks of my year and they're the two most fun weeks of my year, but, (laughs) My year is incredibly varied, and that's another thing that I think that has kept me interested and fascinated by the field all these years. You know, uh, uh, last year, I mean, I did a barbecue university in Turin, Italy, which was amazing. Uh, I did barbecue research in Morocco and uh, and uh, Portugal. Uh, I had a book come out in Italian. I have a TV show uh, in Italy, and for that, I've been learning Italian. I do a TV show in French in Montreal, so I kind of, uh, 30 years later, managed to figure out a way to make my uh, education in French literature pay off. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's always, it's varied, fascinating, and of course, you meet terrific people. Yeah, and like I said, and I think it, it's even you know better because you're actually teaching people how to do something. It's you're just not a celebrity for celebrity's sake. People look up to you because of the the many years that you've shown them how to cook amazing food. So well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. Teaching is really it's it's my byword and all of my uh, activities. Uh, you know, barbecue university, uh, which incidentally we just moved to a new location. Uh, the Montage Palmetto Bluffs Resort in uh, South Carolina. And uh, when I plan a barbecue university, I really sit down and, you know, the first thing I can do is I think, what is it that I want to teach? Then I pick menus that will illustrate the important points, the five methods of live fire cooking, uh, all the major proteins, you know, all the courses of a meal, all the meals of a day. I mean, all that get gets a very intricate little Rubik's cube of recipes designed uh, to impart the mag- the maximum barbecue wisdom that I can come up with. Now, how many students do you have when you do one of these barbecue universities? Is it limited to a you know, certain few? Do you have? Uh... Yeah, we are we are capped at fifty at uh, at the Montage Resort. And it's really going to be a neat program. We're going to start with a traditional low country oyster roast uh, on Friday night, Thursday night, rather. And then we've got, I've developed a style of teaching I call the participation demonstration. So um, uh, the first hour, I demonstrate the techniques I want everybody to master. And the second hour and a half, the group has been divided into teams. They execute under my supervision. The last half hour, we come together, uh, we played our masterpieces, we do a critique of our masterpieces, uh, and then we eat, we break bread together. Uh, So it's fun, it's informative, and what's really exciting for me is that, and it never fails to happen, you get uh, 50 people who have never cooked together, and by the third day, they are operating like a, a, a kitchen brigade. I mean, they are... You know, if there are eight dishes in the menu, they're turning out 16 dishes because they're inventing, improvising. Um, it's, uh, it's just an amazing experience. Now, how many of those do you do a year? Would you do more than well, one do, at that resort? Or I do one a year uh, at that resort uh, in, in the United States. Uh, typically, I will do barbecue universities uh, in Europe. And then I have a, you know, sometimes I will do the university for, uh, for private corporate clients. Now, do those sell out pretty quick when you, when you announce them? They do. Yeah. How, and I guess they could go to your main website, right? SteveReichland.com to find out. Well, actually I would go to barbecuebible.com. 
B A R B C U E B I B L E dot com. And Barbecue Bible is kind of my home page, home home page for all things barbecue. And there, if you uh, at the very uh, uh, right at the top of the page, you click Barbecue University and read all about it, and that'll take you to the sign up page. So that leads me into asking you this question. Um, have you ever thought about doing something like the masterclass, uh, you know, video series or the uh, barbecue stars that just came out with Meathead and some of the others? Have you ever thought of doing something like that? Yeah, I have. Uh, I haven't found quite the right opportunity yet, but, um, uh, you know, I always keep an open, open ear to opportunities. And, you know, for the moment, I find that the audience I get with P- with uh, public television is um, – that's a, that's a pretty good size audience. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and that's where I've watched, you know, 90% of your stuff. Well, YouTube as well, because a lot of it is now on YouTube. So, uh, thank the internet. <laughs> um, we're going to take a real quick break here for, uh, for one of my sponsor ads and we're going to come back and we're going to, we're going to delve into something I like to talk about with some of my barbecue guys is, uh, the new barbecue technology out there. So I'll be right back with Mr. Steve Reichlin. Hey all, I want to welcome again Inkbird as our sponsor for the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. Inkbird has more than just barbecue thermometers and instant read thermometers that I've talked about before. Inkbird just came out with a Wi-Fi sous vide circulator that I've been using for a few weeks now that works pretty good. It has over 1,000 watts of power, it has an app that has many times and temps for meats and vegetables, also has onboard times and temps for meats and vegetables. Runs really quiet. Fits most regular sous vide containers that are the size of the Innovas. So check it out. Look below, there's a link with a code for 30% off of the Amazon price that makes it under $60 right now. So check out the Inkbird Wi-Fi sous vide circulator in the description below. Back to our program. All right, we're back with Steve Reichlin, and we are going to talk about barbecue technology because it's one of the things that just blows my mind the last few years, especially with some of the things that have been coming out with barbecue. I mean, barbecue's been around for a long time. I mean, I started cooking it, you know, with my grill, my little gas grill when I was 19 years old. And, you know, uh, you know, I remember just, it was either a Weber kettle or a Weber gas grill that was out there. And, um, then eventually they started making, you know, these little smokers and, uh, you know, the bullet type smokers and stuff. But nowadays there is just so many different types of grills and the technology that's going into them. Uh, what do you think? So you've been in this a long time professionally. Uh, what do you think of what's going on with all this technology and barbecue? Well, I'm a pretty old school guy. And I guess I'm happiest when I'm cooking over a wood or charcoal fire. Uh, Although I do use a gas grill. I own a gas grill. Uh, I have, in the course of my work in TV shows, used, uh, you know, devices that uh, you control with your smartphone. Uh, But I'm pretty much a look at it, poke it, touch it, take its temperature kind of guy. So the the Wi-Fi control and Bluetooth and... All these uh, different uh, gadgets really don't impress you too much, huh? Well, they impress me. They're just not for me. And maybe it's a generational thing. Um, You know, I'm glad it evolves. And anything that brings more people to the field and uh, anything that gets more people grilling makes me happy. Uh, But... You know, uh, like I said, I'm uh, I'm I'm pretty old school. Now, I mean, a few devices that I I, I have found indispensable. A good instant meat re- uh, instant read meat thermometer is pretty in- in- indispensable. I like those uh, those laser thermometers. Uh, I like the airflow controllers that enable you to work on a, a Kamado cooker and you know do a burn for twelve or sixteen or eighteen hours at a consistent temperature. Um, I suppose if I were more techie, I might like some of the the, the wireless uh, iPhone stuff. But you know what? I use my iPhone and my computer so much for work that when I'm grilling, I think I kind of want to I want to return to my inner caveman. Yeah, and, and I I feel the same way. I I use some of that stuff just if I'm in a hurry or I don't have the time to 
babysit a grill. I, I, you know, I have a pellet grill that I use for that. If I come home, I'm tired. I don't want to sit there and, you know, man the fire. I'll turn that thing on, you know, pop open a beer and throw my food on and then cook it up and take it off. But, um, as far as using it all the time, but you know, one of the things I think technology does is the people that have always been too, uh, you know, scared or, uh, you know, not comfortable firing up a charcoal grill or, or wood fire grill and, and it makes it easier for them. So now they feel like a pit master, <laughs> they can do it and, and produce some good results. So what, what are your thoughts on pellet grills? Well, um, you know, you can't beat their convenience. I mean, uh, sort of basically pellet grill is a bit of a misnomer because they're not really grills with the few exceptions of like the Memphis wood fire grill, you know, where you can actually move the, remove right. the it's over the burn chamber. But, uh, and then running them low is where you get the maximum smoke. Um, they're convenient. Uh, again, I, I, you know, I, rather than set it and forget it, I kind of like when I'm smoking a brisket, it gives me an excuse to be home and outside for, uh, you know, 12 or 14 hours. And I like that. Yeah. And I think there's people out there that have been doing it a long time, like me and you that, that have that mentality. It's like they're convenient, but you know, are they going to produce, produce the best barbecue? Uh, you know, they could probably produce good barbecue, but I like being able to mess with the, you know, I, I held back. I, I've, I've cooked a lot on Kamado's. I, I had Kamado Joe for a number of years and um, I cooked a lot on that and I got my c- cooker dialed in. I mean, uh, you know, with just the vents. So I held back from getting any kind of temperature controller or fan, you know, for a long time, but you know, I did break down and I got one and I used it a couple times and it's okay. But I, I find myself forgetting to even check the, the iPhone or the iPad for it, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, you know, I can set my vents up pretty easy to get to the temperature I want. So, mm-hmm. but I, I think it does, it brings more of the people that are not comfortable with it that haven't done it. You know, and it makes them feel like they can be or produce that the food that, you know, uh, pit masters can that have been doing it for a long time. Well, like I said, anything that gets people grilling. I mean, I think also there's a, you know, there's a generational uh, difference. And I know my daughter is, you know, she cannot exist without her iPhone in her hand. Drives me crazy, but um, that's, you know, that's her generation. So I imagine that that generation is very, you know, that's how they want to grill with an iPhone in their hand. Yeah. And, and also you get the, uh, I kind of used the analogy of a, you know, the guy who's a big golfer who has to get the new club, you know, when it comes out, thinks it's going to make his, you know, ball go farther or what have you, you get the the gadget people who any new gadget that comes out, they have to look at it and try to get it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, barbecue is uh, just like that. It's like a sport to a lot of us, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. By, by the way, the subject of technology, and I know we kind of corresponded about this. You didn't ask me about <laughs> sous vide and barbecue. I don't know if that's on your agenda, but uh, I know that that's the theme of your podcast. So I will just weigh on in on that very uh, briefly. And I'm going to give you kind of a, uh, a paradoxical response. Uh, and on the one hand, I do not do it. And for me, you know, again, I'm old school. It's about meat and fire. Uh, and uh, I, I believe that, you know, there's a certain violence that is uh, involved in cooking meat over fire. You have muscle fibers that contract with the exposure of the heat. You have outs- outside of the flesh that sears and chars. You have burning. And the whole control of sous vide is... I mean, that's the antithesis of that violence that I'm describing. On the other hand, uh, as Tevya said in uh, Fiddler on the Roof, on the other hand, one of probably the two or three best pieces of barbecue I ever had in my life uh, were uh, pastrami beef ribs that were uh, sous vide and then smoked by Nathan Mirvold, the modernist uh, cuisine visionary. So I'm, you know, there is a place in my uniform, in my universe for sous vide. It's not something I do, but if somebody could serve me a rib that was as good as what uh, Nathan did, you know, I'll eat it with pleasure. Well, and that's another thing, you know, I, I talk about 
sous vide and barbecue. I, I talk about sous vide and barbecue together, but I also, it, they can be separate. I mean, there's people that just like the sous vide that aren't really big in the barbecue. And then there's the barbecue guys that have, you know, so, some of the comp cook guys, you know, I talked to Malcolm Reed and, you know, um, and, and some of the others that, you know, they, they haven't really messed with it. So I, I like to cook barbecue, you know, just plain traditional barbecue every once in a while as well. Mm-hmm. I think there's a place for all different cooking methods. And I just like to show people how, you know, you can take a couple, two different cooking methods that are very similar and, and produce a, a different product. For example, I was going to talk about your A5 brisket you cook, but you can take an actual packer brisket sous vide and cook it medium rare you know for 72 hours and you know 132 or 131 and then smoke it you know chill it down and smoke it for a couple hours and get a decent decent bark not the same bark as you would get you know you know 12 to 15 hours in a smoker but you can get a decent smoke and bark and make something that you couldn't make in a smoker so Mm -hmm. that's the kind of things i do with, with with sous vide and try to show people that there's some things you can produce using sous vide and barbecue to, together that you can't do just by using the one or the other cooking method. So. All right. Well, that, okay. So the, the, that I can see a, a use for creating something new and different that didn't exist before. Right. And, and that's kind of what I focus on. I mean, I, me, I like traditional brisket just, just as well as anybody else, you know, so there's room for both methods, but you know, when you can take, two different methods and make something totally different. That's, that's the thing that kind of drives me. And it, it makes my, uh, you know, brain tweak up a little bit. So, <laughs> so I want to talk about some, because one of the videos I, I saw a year, one of the first ones or the only one I saw actually cooking that a five Wagyu packer brisket from crowd cow. And, um, I, I didn't, you know, pony up the money to order one of those. I just kind of wanted to, to ask you, how was that? And how much different was that A5 Wagyu brisket from a, just a regular, like a, a cross Wagyu you get from like, you know, uh, Snake River Farms or a prime brisket you would get somewhere else? Well, it was very different. It was extraordinary. The experience was extraordinary. Looking at it was extraordinary. You know, it kind of looked like white lace over a red tablecloth. That's how well marbled it was. And um, the fat was amazing. Um, butchering it was uh, was an interesting experience because uh, the way they cut it in Japan, it comes out to be about a 35 pound hunk of meat that includes some of the shoulder and a lot of cuts we don't normally associate with brisket. Um, in terms of the flavor, incredibly rich, incredibly buttery. Uh, not really beefy at all. It's really much more about brisket fat. It's almost, you imagine like the brisket fat that is left over after you smoke a brisket and at brisket. And if you get, if you had that in solid form, that's sort of the direction it went in. Yeah. I've had a five steaks, you know, and uh, even some, I, I took some chuck steaks and made those, you know, a five. So, you know, I've had them before. It's just the brisket, I think is, you know, it's, it's totally cooked, totally different. Mm-hmm. And it's a totally different piece of the in the cow, so it always just intrigued me that uh, I I just couldn't you know see myself spending that much money on on a brisket and and uh, having people over <laughs> unless uh, you know unless I hit the lotto or something. But um, it, it just it intrigues me when the, with all you know because that's another thing that's been changing here you know since uh, you know Jap- Japan has been letting some of the you know, the, the wagyu cows you know there's people in Texas now that are you know, uh, raising a hundred percent, you know, bread Wagyu, uh, it's not from Japan and it's not raised exactly the same way, but they are, ha- you know, they do have some hundred percent, you know, Wagyu breed and there's a lot of crossbred as well. So, uh, what's your thoughts on Wagyu compared to, you know, Angus and prime and, you know, and, and CAB and all that, you know, Wagyu is all over the map and yeah. I've had some that has been extraordinary. I've had some that has been no more remarkable than uh, choice beef. Um, There's no grading system. There's no way of rating Wagyu in the United States. Uh, And it it is extremely variable, but uh, it it can be exceedingly delicious. Uh, It's often more buttery and more uh, luscious than 
uh, Angus beef or black Angus, but not always. Uh, but again, anything that generates excitement and makes us think about barbecue in a new way uh, is a great thing in my book. Yeah, I kind of agree. I've had I've had some really good, you know, Wagyu, and I've had some, eh, that's not, I can't really tell that different from, you know, just a, a prime, you know, steak or what have you. So it's, uh, they're all will, over the board. <laughs> I will tell you a funny thing about uh, the Wagyu steer. Uh, when we were taping uh, Project Fire at the Alice All Guest Ranch and Resort in Solvang, California, uh, we went up to the Fest Parker Winery and Ranch, and they brought uh, Bubba, who was a, uh, I guess, a breeding steer for Wagyu, whose, uh, whose ancestors came from Japan. And I actually got to ride Bubba. Uh, turns out <laughs> Wagyu, Wagyu are extremely uh, docile animals, much more so than a, a Black Angus or a Hereford. So there's a picture of me sitting uh, a straddle on Bubba, the Wagyu steer. And that will be one of the fun memories that I, uh, I take to my grave. That's funny. So um, I know this wasn't on our uh, outline, but I just kind of, what, what are some of the, the weirdest or I'd say the, the, the most um, different things that you've cooked in your career that uh, just kind of come to the top? Oh boy. Uh well, you know, uh, in Mexico, uh, they eat a lot of insects, chili, grasshoppers, uh, uh, termite eggs, chapulinas, which are fun. Uh, so those are pretty strange. In Korea, they, um, they grill uh, seaweed, uh, which makes it all crunkly. Uh, nori seaweed makes it kind of crinkly, and that's a great garnish. Uh, in Uruguay, they have a dish called choto, which is uh, sheep's small intestines uh, kind of coiled up in a sausage shape and then wrapped with more small intestines. And those are grilled. And that actually turns out to be a heck of a lot better than it sounds. The Greeks have something called kokoretsi, which is, let's see, it's brain, liver, spleen, lungs, uh, pancreas, kidneys testicles, which are all skewered, and then they're wrapped in a small intestine to hold the whole thing together and spit roasted, sort of like haggis on a spit. And that's pretty interesting. So I guess I've eaten some pretty strange things in my career. <laughs> some of those uh, sound like uh, something Andrew Zimmer would uh, be eating in his uh, Food Network show. But, um, yeah, I'm sure with all the traveling you've done throughout the world and uh, all these uh, books and, and episodes of your barbecue uh, show, you, you've had a chance to experiment with a lot of different um, stuff that uh, most people in America wouldn't uh, even consider eating. So, well, let's move along uh, and uh, go to the next topic here. All right, so um, we talked about a lot of great things, but what I want to talk about now is the projects you're working on right now. Let's let's talk about what you're doing right now. Well, okay. Uh, at the moment, uh, when you uh, called, I'm working on my new book, which is a book called uh, Grilling Green, and it is a vegetable-forward grill book. I won't quite say vegetarian, but it's a primarily vegetable and meatless-oriented grill book. Uh, we're getting ready for the taping of the next season of my Project Fire TV show. I'm working on a French language TV show that will be taped in Montreal in the springtime. <clears throat> and finally, I have a, uh, I'm consulting on a restaurant on the Windstar cruise ship line that will be launching in May. Uh, so we're in the process of planning that. A lot going on in Reichlandia. Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, it doesn't sound like you have too much time to, to relax. So, <laughs> no, it's um, I get my. You know, I always I always like to joke. I'm self-employed and I have a tyrant for a boss. <laughs> That's funny. Um, that last thing you mentioned. It seems like I like to cruise. My wife loves to cruise, and we usually go. Uh, once a year in December for her, like her birthday celebration. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of that lately in the last, you know, five or six years where celebrity chefs have um, opened up uh, restaurants or, uh, you know, yeah, I, I know Guy Fieri has, 
Carnival, and it has a barbecue and a burger place on some of their ships. I think Emerald Lagasse is opening up one on their Carnival's newest ship. So it seems like a trend where, um, you know, these cruise ships are, you know, part of their competitive edge is seeing who they can get for uh, specific uh, food. So that sounds great that you're going to have that opportunity. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. And uh, what they've done uh, to make room for the restaurant is also pretty remarkable. They've actually cut the ship in half and added uh, added a section that will expand it by uh, several hundred feet, making room for the restaurant and also for more staterooms. And that's being done in Palermo, Italy. So, uh, uh, you know, when we board the ship to uh, do the training for the restaurant, it'll be not a brand new boat, but a uh, uh, a brand new, uh, a much expanded boat. So on something like that, do you, you get hands-on training? You train the people that are uh, going to be running the restaurant and do you do like a, do you christen it uh, and all that? Well, uh, the christening, uh, goes to the president of, uh, the company. Uh, and in terms of the training, I'm actually going to send the chef from, uh, the project smoke and project fire TV shows, uh, to do the initial training then I'll be on board for the uh, inaugural launch. Well, that sounds great. Sounds like a lot of fun and uh, a lot of excitement going on there for sure. Let's, let's talk about project uh, fire. Uh, I know you had project smoke was a really big success for you. And, and, and I guess uh, uh, project fire is, is strictly cooking over open fire. Correct. Well, it's a grilling show as opposed to a smoking show. Uh, right. And we use many different styles of uh, grilling. Uh, I mean, you know, we'll work for every, uh, work with everything from a $10,000 stainless, uh, steel gas super grill to uh, a number of different wood burners. We'll be using pellet grills, uh, open fire. Um, you know, the idea of the show is really to, uh, everybody knows how to grill now. Uh, I hope at least in part, thanks to barbecue Bible and how to grill. And this is how to take your grilling to the next level. Yeah. And I think uh, one of the things I like that you do is is show people all the different methods and ways. And like you said, cultural uh, as well. You get you get down deep into that stuff. And, you know, I think uh, people need to to know about that because you know, the, the grilling and smoking and, and backyard cooking can be so much more than what most people think, for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, Absolutely. Uh, yep. Uh, you know, as we discussed yesterday, grilling is the world's oldest method. It's the most uh, diverse and universal method, but it's done differently everywhere. And uh, I think we've long since gone from the days when grilling was for a special occasion to uh, just another way that we cook. Yeah. I mean, and that's one of the things I love. I have Kamado grills, and one of the things I love about them, the versatility. Mm-hmm. I get to bake bread. I can make stuff. Anything I can pretty much make in the oven or on the stove, you can make outside. In now, a- but I do have a thought about that, which is you can do anything you can cook in a stove uh, or an oven outside, but why would you? And for me, there always needs to be a compelling reason. Like, I wouldn't bake a cake or a cheesecake uh, on the grill unless I were adding something I couldn't get in the oven. So in this case, for me, it might be a, uh, a smoked cheesecake. That was a, a recipe I did in Project Smoke. And there you're taking, you know, you're taking traditional cheesecake and by the uh, addition of smoke, you're turning it into something wondrous. Right. And, and what I'm talking about, like it's stuff that you would cook in a wood-fired uh, oven, like there's a lot of different breads that, you know, uh, they use wood fired ovens for especially. So of course, but um, well, that's great. looks like you are very busy. Anything else you'd like to talk about? Uh, Let's see other initiatives we have going. Well, I've got my project smoke line of barbecue sauces and barbecue rubs. And we'll be expanding that this year. Uh, I guess the big thing for me is uh, barbecue university, which is the school that uh, uh, the three day, three night school that I used to run at the Broadmoor resort in Colorado Springs and that school is now being moved to uh, the Montage uh, Palmetto Bluff uh, Resort in South Carolina. And uh, it's a really beautiful location on the May River. I've always been in the mountains. I'm a water guy, so I'm super happy to, uh, to be, finally be on the water. And that will take place Father's Day weekend, uh, limited to 50 people. And uh, if people want information on that, they can find it on my website, which is barbecuebible.com 
That's B-A-R-B-E-C-U-E-B-I-B-L-E.com. So are tickets available for that already, or is it? Uh... Oh, it's almost sold out, in fact. Okay. So yeah. uh, if you're interested or your listeners are interested, uh, now would be the time to uh, to, to uh, book, book it. Well, we're going to make sure we get, put a link to your website uh, in the description of the uh, of the podcast as well, so people have the ability to uh, to go ahead and and click on that and find out more information. Pretty much, they can find out anything you want to find out about Steve Reichlin. You can find it on barbecuebible dot com, and I'll have a link in the description below. And um, that's great. I, I just want to thank you again, Stephen, for being on. Uh, it's been great talking to you. Hopefully. You know, we can have you on again down the road. And um, thanks again. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. And, uh, and uh, you know, I look forward to connecting again. Yeah, I look forward to reading your next book, too. Take care. Bye-bye. All righty. Thank you, sir. Bye. Well, guys, thanks for joining me today. I'm very happy to have had Stephen Reichlin on from Barbecue Bible, Project Smoke, Project Fire, Barbecue University, and about... 30 other books and uh, TV shows. Um, I'm glad I uh, was able to get him on. Look forward to having him on again. Make sure you uh, check out his website, barbecuebible.com. I'll put a link in the description below. Also, check out our sponsor, Inkbird. Uh, I'll have to add uh, links in the uh, description below as well for them. Make sure you follow the Fire and Water Cooking Facebook group, Facebook page. We do a lot of interactive uh, work there also check out the fire and water cooking instagram page and fire and water cooking youtube channel where i do some great videos and follow us again on the next fire and water cooking podcast thanks again